Israel finds itself embroiled in deep political crisis days after its parliament passed the first major step in Prime Minister Netanyahu's judicial overhaul. This part of the legislation eliminated the Israeli Supreme Court's power to block government actions that the court deems unreasonable. The controversial move drove crowds of Israelis back onto the streets in protest. The White House weighed in as well, saying the move was unfortunate. To understand the complexities of Israel and the Middle East, who better to ask than the New York Times columnist Tom Friedman, who won his first two Pulitzer Prizes reporting from that region. Welcome, Tom. Explain to us first, what is this about, you know, because it feels like a small step, but it is part of a series of moves planned to curtail the Supreme Court's power. And why are they trying to do that? Why is this narrow majority trying to do that? So, Fareed, you have to start out with uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu's political situation. He tried to make a political comeback. He had become so unpopular within his own party, lost so many allies, that he had to reach over the fence of Israeli politics and bring into Israeli politics people who had never been there before. Uh, Tamir Prado, the former head of the Mossad, uh, basically equated them to the American Ku Klux Klan. So imagine if a president... Uh, brought uh, members of the Ku Klux Klan into the cabinet. Now, the only way he could hold these people together in a coalition with his other only allies left, the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, he basically had to accede to their demands. What are their big demands? Um, this Israeli version of the Ku Klux Klan or the American Proud Boys basically wants one thing. They're Jewish supremacists. They want annexation of the West Bank. More settlements, um, more absorption of the West Bank, ultimately annexation. What do the ultra-Orthodox want? They want um, their sons not to have to serve in the military, and they want their schools to be free to teach only religious subjects and no math, science, reading, or democratic civics. Who stands in the way of that? One body left in Israel with independence, the judiciary, the Supreme Court. So the religious want the Supreme Court out of the way, basically so it won't interfere with their efforts basically to teach purely religious subjects and not have to serve in the military, and the right-wing Jewish supremacists want the court out of the way so it won't be um, interfering with their attempts to seize a more Palestinian land and build more Palestinian settlements and to legalize more wildcat illegal Israeli settlements. That's what this is about. And it's fair to say that these people are on the streets because there are very few limits on uh, on, the, on a, an elected government in Israel. There is no written constitution. There's no upper house, no Senate. There are no state governments. Uh, this is what you have. And that's why people are out on the street because in a sense, the street is where you can be heard. Well, you know, you really can't make this up in, in some ways, Fareed. Um, the Supreme Court's ability to um, basically uh, curtail government excess is this a reasonableness cause that comes out of British law. Why would a government want to get rid of a reasonableness cause that the court enjoyed unless they wanted to do things that were unreasonable? Of course, that's what the Israeli public understood. And that's until you always been saying this is a small thing, this is a little thing. Nonsense. This was a power grab. It had nothing to do with legal reform. That None of that's on the level. If you wanted to do legal reform, if you wanted to do the Israeli equivalent of a constitutional amendment in the United States, oh my goodness, you would have done that over a long period of time, brought in legal exports, experts worked for a consensus. They did none of this. They had a majority. They rammed it through. End of story. Now, when you, th when you think going forward, um, what is a little worrying, uh, and I've talked to Israeli friends of mine who talk about this, is that the parts of the coalition that you're describing uh, that, that are backing Netanyahu, uh, particularly on some of this more extreme stuff, they're all the people in Israel who have eight children. And the people who are opposing, the, the, the old secular elites and such, the tech guys, they're all you know, having two children, if that. Um, is this a port portentous for Israel's future demographically? You know, definitely, Fareed. You know, this is both a legal fight and a and a social revolution, basically. You know, the ultra-Orthodox you know, represent about 20% of the population. Their, their numbers double, you know, every uh, 20, 25 years. They'll be 40% of Israel, uh, you know, in 20, 25 years. 40% uh, of Israel, that means, will not have studied science, math, English, or democratic civics. Um, the uh, secular... Um, you know, tech, uh, educated, Western-oriented part of Israel 
uh, basically pays tw uh, uh, is 20 percent of the population. They pay, they pay about 90 percent of the taxes and they fight 105 percent of the wars. So behind this this sort of legal issue is is a, is a feeling that, hey, you know, I was ready to do that. As long as it was live and let live, you know, Freed. I've lived in two countries in the Middle East um, uh, intensely: Lebanon and Israel. They have one big thing in common: they're tiny countries with incredibly diverse populations. Very small, but incredibly diverse. The only way countries like that can work is on the principle of uh, live and let live. No victor, no vanquished. That's what Lebanon blew up, uh, unfortunately, over the last 20 years. That's what Israel is blowing up now. Live and let live. It was the only way. And Netanyahu was ready to burn it up um, just in order to pursue uh, political power uh, and keep himself out of jail. And one more thing, Tom, in your uh, reporting, you've talked to the president uh, a, a bunch of times about all this. Um, you say that there is a kind of Hail Mary here that might, might save the situation, which is that Israel and Bibi Netanyahu want a normalization with Saudi Arabia, but the Saudis might impose terms that make it very hard to do some of the more radical stuff that, that Bibi wants to do. How likely is that given that the Saudis have not seemed particularly interested in the fate of the Palestinian people? Yeah, um, the, the, the problem for the Saudis is they can't get this deal through except under a Joe Biden presidency um, uh, because Democrats wouldn't support it at all under Republican presidency. Um, and, and that means Joe Biden has to be attentive to his base and his base of the party um, uh, you know, cares a lot uh, that this be a fair deal, fair for the Palestinians. So the Saudi, Saudis may not be interested in this, but um, uh, the U.S. Senate is, is, is quite interested in this, and the base of the Democratic Party is interested in this. You know, it's an ironic situation, Fareed. The crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, holds a lot of the future in his hands. He may not be interested in Jewish history, but Jewish history is interested in him. <laughs> Tom Friedman, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Fareed.